Luke 12, verse 19 to 20 reads, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? These pleasures and delights, although good and enjoyable, will not satisfy our souls and will not bring us true joy and happiness. But if we live our lives for God in obedience to His word and commandments, then we'll be rewarded with eternal life and joy. This is our life's calling. So I encourage you to live for the Lord. Live a life that is mindful of eternity. Be mindful of collecting treasures in heaven, treasures that will not perish. Be mindful that your thoughts, your deeds, your actions, they all matter. It's only when we live a life dedicated and committed to Jesus Christ that we can hope to one day have everlasting life in His presence. So let's make the right choices while we're here on earth. Because what we do here affects our eternity. The Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4 verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Amen. Let us be serious. Let us be watchful and on guard. Let us not take our salvation lightly, but instead, let us wait on the Lord fervently. The future. What does the future hold? Or perhaps I should ask, what does your future hold? Have you ever thought about where your life is heading? I'm not talking about fulfilling your dreams or desires. My question is, do you know where you will spend your eternity? Because it's so easy to forget that this earth is not our real home. This earth is not our final destination. Yes, of course, God created this earth and placed us here to live a fulfilling and fruitful life, a life of service to Him and a life that witnesses to others. But this is just the tip of the iceberg regarding our service to Him. This world also serves as an opportunity for us to prepare ourselves before we go to live with Him in His kingdom for all eternity. That is His plan for all mankind. However, not everyone will accept Jesus Christ. Not everyone will want to take part in His perfect plan. Some have chosen, some will choose, the road to destruction. You see, time is short, and it's the way we live our lives here on earth. That's what will determine where we spend our eternity. And in His love, God has told us through His Word how we can guarantee eternal life with Him. And so the problem that we all have is, how do we live this current life and be fruitful when we're required to be storing up treasures in heaven? There is certainly no getting away from the fact that this life we live demands so much from us. Different people and circumstances demand our time, energy, effort, and attention. Your job has its demands. You have your own personal desires and demands. If you're married, your husband or wife will have their own demands. Your family will have their own demands. You see, in every area of life, there are demands. And these demands keep us so busy and preoccupied that we can often lose sight of what's eternal. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. There is a balancing act to be made. How do I pay attention to my physical needs without neglecting my spiritual needs? Some of the demands that we have in this world are essential and necessary for our survival and well-being, while other demands are not necessary at all. 
In fact, I would even go so far as saying some of the demands that we pay attention to do more harm than good in our lives. Think of the young lady who feels as though the world demands for her to be perfect when it comes to her looks, perfect when it comes to her body, perfect hair, complexion, all of that according to the world's standards of beauty. Think of the young man who thinks the world demands him to have a lot of money, or they'll say he's nothing. Buy an expensive luxury car, or you're nothing. Have a bodybuilder's physique, or you're nothing. These are the world's demands. Or think of the husband and wife who struggle and work themselves into an early grave, all so that they can keep up with the Joneses and get the best house, the best car, and send their kids to the best private schools. So much of what we do and how we think is because of the standards that society or humankind has set. But this is not God's will, nor is it pleasing to Him. Although we are in this world, we are not of this world, and therefore should be living for God, according to His standards and His will. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Romans 12, verse 2, when he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And again, we're reminded in Romans 14, verse 8, For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So what does living for the Lord look like? Well, it means to have Him as the center of our lives, to seek His will before our own selfish desires, to listen to His voice among all the other voices we hear, and to make it our life's mission to serve Him in all that we do. All of this is easier said than done. It is much easier for us to choose to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. It's easier to choose the broad road over the narrow one. It's easier to choose the world over God because the world and the flesh go hand in hand. Choosing God means that you have to deny yourself. You have to choose His will over your own. Living for God is not an easy task. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The narrow gate may be tiresome and difficult to enter into, but believe me, it's worthwhile. Christ is knocking on the door of our hearts. He wants us to choose eternal life and not damnation. But here's the thing. The Lord is so gentle and kind that He doesn't force Himself in. Instead, He waits for us to respond to His knock. The knock on our hearts. The knock that calls us to repent. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord addresses His church and says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And I would also like to highlight the fact that Psalm 95 verse 8 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Let us open our hearts to his voice. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart, the Bible says. The voice which you hear when you pray, when you read His Word, or when you're convicted by the Holy Spirit. Let us not harden our hearts. Let's not grieve the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to listen and respond to the knock of Christ. Let's open the door and let Him in, so that He may dwell with us and in us. Once we've done this, He will write our names in His book of life. Now, part of the struggle in hearing God's voice for many Christians is due to them focusing on the wrong things. 
And that's part of the deception of the devil. He wants you to feel as though everything else apart from God deserves your undivided attention. The devil wants you to meet the demands of the world, but not what God demands of a Christian man or woman. So let's not be deceived by the prince of this world. Don't be deceived by the evil one who wants us to focus on the pleasures and temporary happiness that this world offers us.